Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Evie. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I want to thank the many of you who gave me a very, very warm welcome. Um, it, um, I've never, I think, been to a meeting in San Diego, and uh, so it's really nice to be here. Um, I want to also thank Cambria for her 10 minutes. Uh, we would not have drank together. I'm quite certain of that um, at all. <laughs> And you'll, you'll know why. Um, I mean, I didn't get dolled up until I got sober. And that was like, you know, four and a half years ago when I got dolled up and wore a dress for the first time. So anyway, um, so um, in our format, it talks about, you know, we share in a general way what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now. And, um, you know, I'll just, first of all, I really want to welcome everybody that raised their hand. Um, and, and especially to those who, who perhaps didn't raise your hand. And um, I was there, as were all of us. Um, you know, today, how my day looked today was I didn't drink today. And uh, now I also talked to my sponsor. I had a two-and-a-half, two-hour, ten-minute drive from L.A. to here. So I also talked to my sponsor, and uh, my sponsor said, don't cry. Um, remember there's humor, so uh, hopefully I won't cry. Um, but what my day looked like today was first I didn't drink, bottom line. Um, and I had a, okay, we can't cry because the sponsor will hear about it. We know this. Um, I had a conversation with my brother for about two and a half hours, um, which might not seem like a real big deal. Um, he got out of prison two months ago, and I hadn't seen him for 13 years. And and before that, he was just, we were hardly in each other's lives, you know. And, you know, in the big book, it talks about how we made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. And I made a lot, a lot of why I drank was because I made a lot of decisions based on self. And my brother had a lot to do with that, that fueled my alcoholism. And so today I'm talking to him. And now you need to know that everything that I share is how I perceived it. But what I'm finding out is that how I perceived it and what really happened are not necessarily the same at all. And talking to my brother, how he perceived growing up in Hawaii, how he perceived his acid trip, how he perceived why he went to prison, all of that wasn't bad. But for me, oh, my God, I mean, I was the biggest victim, and that fueled my alcoholism for decades, you know. And so today, in many ways, it was one of those great events that came to pass, where I got to find out that what I really thought happened didn't. And so I can finally start to let go of a lot of that, you know, because, again, it fueled my alcoholism. Um, So uh, I was born in New York, in Ithaca. My dad was a mathematician. My mom, they met in college. And what I remember is we lived in Boston, when I was in, like, second grade, and we had snow forts and Toll House chocolate chip cookies, and it was a lot of fun. There was a lot of love. It was just, it was homey. It was everything I thought an awesome childhood would be. And then we moved to Santa Cruz, and my parents started fighting, and it was just, it was different. It was very, very different. There, there was no snow forts. There was no homey home. And then my parents got divorced. Now, my dad's Jewish, my mom's Chinese, and my mom's whole side of the family live in Hawaii. So my mom, my brother, and I, we all moved to Hawaii to live with my grandmother and my great-grandmother. My grandmother and my great-grandmother are Chinese. My great-grandmother has these tiny bound feet. She only speaks Chinese. I don't speak Chinese other than son of a bitch, you know, and, and, and vulgarity that she used to yell at me. 
because I was that kind of kid. Um, but so we moved to Hawaii when I was in the third grade, and, and for me, what it was like, what I remember now, again, talking to my brother or my mom, or you know, it might have been very different, but, but from my eyes, in seventh, in third grade at seven years old, what I remember is that you wake up at three in the morning, and there's just like these one-inch roaches. I mean, there's just roaches everywhere in the in the kitchen. And then we had these, the, all the windowsills were like rotted with termites, and then they were like spider webs. And we lived in this stucco house with a flat roof. You know, we didn't have a normal roof. Um, my great grandmother would put this tiger bomb on her, so she always smelled weird. I, now my brother was smart and handsome. Now I, on the other hand, I had like severe butt teeth. So I mumbled when I talked. I had, been trying to, when I was a year prior to this, I was jumping over a, a bench and I tripped and I chipped my tooth. So I had this really weird cap on my front tooth. I had these horn rim glasses. You know, I mean, they're nothing good. And they were all scratched in the middle and they were kind of cockeyed. You know, I had like scraggly brown hair. And, and I, you know, I mean, I had just moved from Santa Cruz. Now, some of you may not remember a show called Gilligan's Island, but, well, I did and a lot of us did. And I thought we were moving to Gilligan's Island. I mean, I literally thought, you know, we're, we're moving to an island. I'm, I'm seven years old. I have no concept of history. So I'm looking, I'm expect, first of all, I, I don't even know if you speak English. You know, I'm expecting like face paint and spears and grass huts and, you know, I mean, natives, you know, natives. And, and I'm pale and I'm wearing knee socks and they're local and they, they talk funny. It's called pidgin English, you know, and, and I'm, I'm half Chinese and I'm half Caucasian, so that makes me a hop a if you've ever been to Hawaii. But, but I don't look local. I, I talk funny, I mumble. And, you know, kids being kids, that first week of third grade, I'm, I'm now teased. Cause I, I talk funny, I look funny, I act funny, I, 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 and, and, and my whole life, for me, that divorce like just blew the roof off of everything I knew about what security looked like, you know? So so now what I start doing is I, you know, I'm the ugly duckling. I, you know, you look like crap, you smell like crap. Why don't you go back where you came from? You know, so I'm getting all the teasing and the bullying. And and, and um, so I start taking the actions to melt that barbed wire that's starting to grow inside me. You know, I start stealing. If I have the clothes that you're wearing, you know, you put two on a hanger, you go in the dressing room, oh, doesn't fit, and only one on the hanger comes back out. And on the rack, well, you know, the other one's like pocketed. So if I have the clothes that you have, then I'll look like you and maybe the teasing will stop. You know, but the obsession of the mind was just taking over. You know, there's a cute boy in third grade, his name was Brian, he walked pigeon toed and he was popular. I walked pigeon toed, he laughs, I laugh. You know, I mean, I start imitating you so that again, I can camouflage myself so it'll all stop. You know, the stealing is getting worse. I'm stealing food. I'm stealing money. I'm stealing clothes. I'm just, I'm just stealing a lot. You know, I'm, I'm sugar. Oh my God. I mean, I was like binging on sugar. I mean, just like I would steal five dollars, which, you know, back when you're in the sixties, five dollars is a lot of, a lot of candy bars. You know, I mean, 20 cents a candy bar. That's a lot of candy bars. And I would just, Binge on that, and I would just be like so stoned on sugar, you know. I mean, if you could be, I mean, I'm sure some of you were, you know. Um, and I, you know, no, I don't have any structure. I don't have any discipline. Again, as as far as I'm concerned, my life is over. I'm in this foreign state. They talk weird. They look weird. Yet I'm the one that's getting all of it, you know. And I don't feel like I have anybody to turn to, you know. No one tells me you're supposed to take a bath every day or a shower every day. So I take a shower once a week, it's a brown film over water, and then I get up and it's right back on me. My grandmother drinks on a daily basis, and she urinates on the couch as well. So I come home from school and I plop on the couch to watch TV, and it's wet because she urinated. But do I have the self-esteem to get off the couch? No. Do I have the self-esteem to get off the couch and change my clothes? No. So I go to school in the same clothes that I slept in that I wore the day before. So, you know, through inventories, you know, because I resented those kids. Oh, my God. 
you know, because I was the ugly duckling. You know, but when I looked at some of my own behavior during an inventory, I mean, I took the actions to smell like crap. You know, so I kind of brought it on myself, and I didn't have the self-esteem to know any better. You know? We can't cry. Sponsor might hear this. Um, so the teasing goes from third grade to seventh grade. In the seventh grade, my best friend, I become really good at stealing. And I steal these three-ring binders that kind of fold in trifolds. And my best friend says, you know, you're really good at that. I want one. So I bring my book to the store, and I steal her one. Right? That's what a best friend does. And I get caught. And they call the cops. And I get taken down to the police station. And I'm smiling. I'm laughing. I don't, my feelings were never really appropriate. I didn't know how to feel. In fact, when I got sober, feelings were a lot like colors. But I never took the color class. So I couldn't tell you I was angry. In fact, growing up in Hawaii, or at least in my household, the Chinese household, there's no flinging frying pans or punching walls. It's that silent scorn. They're just, if looks could kill, you know it. If you know it, you know it. I mean, my great-grandmother, I, she swore at me in Chinese. I mean, just that glare. And I got that glare a lot from a lot of people. You know, from the kids at school, at home, wherever I went, I got that, you know. And see, what happened for me as well is that when there's no vocal words with feelings, the rage, the anger that they had toward me or I had toward them, my head starts creating all these conversations, you know. Anyway, so I get arrested and, and they say if I ever get caught again, I'm going to go to juvie. Now, I had seen fights at the intermediate school where it's just, it looked like this many people, and, and I'm the outcast. I am the Caucasian. I mean, even though I'm half Chinese, I look like the tourist, you know. And so I really knew. Now again, like our, like it says in our book, I made decisions based on self. I don't know if they would have killed me, but in my head, I would have been killed if I ever went to juvie. In fact, the last day of school when I was in junior high and, and in junior high that I can recall was called Kill Holly Day. So I mean, I really believed that they were going to kill me. So basically, I got arrested and I got scared straight. You know, now I still did weird things because I didn't know why. You know, I would walk to school and I would have to touch the telephone pole, touch the telephone pole, jump up twice before I could walk on. I mean, I just had these rituals. I don't know why I did them, but I did them. You know, um, when I was in like 13 and 14, or when I was like 14 years old, I started to take an Aikido class. And uh, it was actually, I, I had started, I had had sips. My grandmother drank Primo beer. Primo beer is the Hawaiian beer. She used to drink. I used to get it for her. I'd crack the bottle and, you know, I'd take a sip. And, you know, she would take a swip, sip, you know, and just go, ah. You know, and, and in our household, you know, there's my mom, my brother, my myself, my great-grandmother. We're all nagging at my grandmother. And sometimes she would just like yell out, you know, God, ah, just let me drink my beer in peace. And just like everything would just shut up. And she would just drink her beer in peace. And I watched what it did for her, you know. My mom worked at a bar, you know. And so I, there was so much about alcohol that appealed to me, but I was still scared. If I got caught, I'm going to juvie. So I got really, uh, there was so much rage and so much hatred and so much anger that, that there was terror that if I got caught and I went to juvie, I'd be dead. You know, so I, I kind of tried to play it straight to a small degree. You know, so when I started drinking, my first, I drank wine coolers, I, I tried beer, I hated the taste of it. I didn't get the effect until I was in an Aikido class and that first shot of sake during a ceremony. And boy, that stuff just burned going down, you know. And I remember, I mean, I just remember, I, you know, I've still, in my mind, by the time I'm 14, 15, you know, the teasing stopped on the outside, but it never, ever, ever stopped on the inside. I was now the one, you know, you're fat, you're ugly, you're this, that, blah, blah, blah. I mean, my head was just always screaming. And that, sake, it burned going down. And then there was, like, conscious awareness that it just melted the barbed wire. You know, it just turned off the voices in my head. It just took away that constant pressure I always felt. You know? 
And or like someone said, it just it filled up the holes in my soul. You know? Um when I was 16, I was in a play in high school. My brother is four years older, and um, he, had the, he did acid, and he had a bad acid trip. Now, from talking with him today, what I know is that he had a bad acid trip. He was hospitalized for about seven weeks. He recovered, and then four months later, he left Hawaii. Up until today... How I remembered it was, he took acid, it fried his brain, he was never the same, and he left Hawaii right then and there. So huge change in my story, just as of today. But what I also remember is this, that he, I, I watched him, he, he had done the acid, and he, I mean, he was flipping out right in front of my eyes. Bad acid trip, let me correct my words. And, um, I remember, I was taking a nap on his bed, and he came into his room, and, and I didn't hear what he said, but he said, Eve, I need my sister. And I got up from the bed, and I said, Mike, what's wrong? And I didn't know what to do, and I just gave him like a sideways hug. And the next thing I remember, now again, I got that clarified today, but the next thing I remember was that he left Hawaii. I didn't realize he left Hawaii several months later. But, you know, the point of what I'm saying is this. When my parents got divorced, my head said I had already started, like our book says, I had started making those decisions based on self. If I were smarter, prettier, if I, if I didn't, you know, muck up, if I wasn't arrested, if I was everything that, if I was just anything other than who I was, maybe they wouldn't have gotten divorced. You know, I used to step on the cracks and my mom had back pain. I didn't know until many years later. <laughs> I mean, you know? When, when it says, you know, we, we wrote down those principles by which we were angry, you know, the, the inventory, the people, places, things, and principles and institutions, you know, one of those principles was, you know, you step on the crack, you break your mother's back. I mean, I believe I broke her back. You know, she broke her back when, when I was a newborn, maybe even before I was born. But again, my head said, it's all your fault. So now my brother... My brother's like my last hope of sanity. And he, in my mind, flipped out, was schizophrenic, left Hawaii, and it's all my fault. You know, so I started drinking with friends in choir and such. But as it says in our book, you know, after his diagnosis, or what I perceived him to be diagnosed schizophrenic, um, Again, I made a decision based on self. I must be schizophrenic too. That's why I had all those rituals. That's why I was the ugly duckling. That's why this and that and this and that. And at that point, my drinking ceased to become an, a luxury and it became a necessity. You know, by the time I was 18, I was drinking on a daily basis. You know, Bill's story, there's so much about Bill's story I love. You know, I, now by the way, you know, if you're looking for someone who drank for decades, you know, or who woke up out of a blackout and said, how do we land this plane? I am not your girl. You know, I, I, I was not, and I say this with respect to all of you who were, I was not the social butterfly. I was not the one who danced in the bars or at the parties with the lampshades and just, you know, made everything fun. You know, I was the one that would go up to a drunk, you know, at some college party and ask, you know, you ever think about dying? You know, why are we here? You know, what's the meaning of life? You know? And ironically, in sobriety, you get to ask those questions, and you also get the answers to them. But, you know, I, if there was ever, and I'm proud to say this today, I couldn't say this back then, but I'm proud to say today that if there was ever a death of the party, I was that. You know? I mean, I was that. And, you know, and I still struggle with, being social. I really do. That's why I'm, I'm really grateful for the newcomers. I, I'm really glad there's so many newcomers here because, uh, just cause. Um, so I, uh, I'm 18 years old and now chapter three is starting to happen. I'm drinking on a daily basis. I'm, I'm, you know, laying on my roof in Hawaii, you know, drinking and, and like Bill, you know, that fierce determination to win would come back. You know, and I'm thinking, you know, I just, I still have all this hatred, self-hatred. I mean, I, Ever since I was in the second grade, 
I remember trying to jump over two sidewalk blocks, and I told myself, if I can't do it, I'm going to kill myself. And I always had this weird, perfectionistic, if this happens, I'm going to kill myself. You know, and, and long into sobriety, you know, my head would say that too. You know, nobody likes you, everybody hates you, you might as well drink, in fact, never mind that, why don't you just die? You know, and I've, I've just learned to, to not act on that. You know, that what you taught me was that we don't get locked up for our thinking, but for our actions. And you taught me that if I take the actions, the feelings follow. I went away to college, I swore off alcohol. What I did was this. My whole life up to that point was mucked up. I was just full of selfishness, self-centeredness, self-hatred, just like I was just ugly inside and out. And then my brother, in my mind, was diagnosed schizophrenic, and then his whole life got mucked up. So in my mind, I made a decision based on self. I took the worst of his life, the worst of my life, and I just put them together in one life, and I just threw it away. My brother was supposed to go to college before he flipped out. So now I'm going to continue where he left off, and I'm going to be somebody. I'm going to show those kids from third grade that I'm somebody. I mean, this is 12 years later, and I'm still resenting them as if it were yesterday. I go away to college. I swear off alcohol, but I have barbed wire. I have screaming voices in my head, and I have this constant internal pressure. You know, for a lot of you, drugs were your outside issue. For me, it was bulimia. You know, it, it took away the insides. I could flush this, this, my schizophrenia down the toilet so I could look like I was normal. And basically what happened is three years later, by the time I'm 22 years old, I'm hitting a bottom. You know, the bottom I, I had when I was in third grade, I was already, by the time I was in third grade, feeling so much self-hatred and smelling like urine. You know, and the bottom line is that 22 years old, all, the only thing that was different was that there was now alcoholism and bulimia. But there was still the self-hatred, the smelling like urine. You know, I, I got sober reading the third edition, and in that story, there's a story called Stars Don't Fall, and she says she felt so ugly on the inside, she didn't care how she looked on the outside. You know, when I came to you, um, my first few meetings were in Tacoma, Washington. Um, what had happened was I... Um, Back in 82, I, my dad, I hated, I hated my parents. I hated my dad. I hated my mom. I blamed them both for my brother. So I go to New York to try to make things right with my dad. And, and the bottom line is, is I'm just drinking on a daily basis. And, uh, and I, I can't deal with him. I, I just hate him. I absolutely hate him. And so I, and I'm questioning my sexuality, bottom line. And so I, I, I it was like a New Year's and I go to a gay bar in New York City. Because I, I just, I didn't know what was wrong with me. I, I, there, I didn't know. I was just such a drunken mess. And, uh, and I meet a, a gal named Andrea. You know, and, um, you know, my whole life, all I ever wanted to do was matter. You know, and Andrea and I are drinking and we're, you know, talking about stealing pool tables. And she tells me the next time we see each other, she has a secret to tell me. Now I have no self-esteem. I have absolutely total self-hatred for myself. But I realize, because I, I, I've been to college, I mean, I'm dropping out of college because of alcoholism, but I realize the secret is she loves me and she wants to marry me. So now I declare a major and I'm just, you know, trying to be good and I'm trying not to drink and I'm trying just just get good grades and, and you know, get to this program so that I can declare this major, pass it, you know, because now I'll have a reason to live. And the bottom line is, is that um, a year later, I go to see her. I go to, actually, I manipulate my dad to let me come to New York where I, I'm not drinking. I'm, I'm basically just there to see her so that she'll tell me that she wants to marry me, and now I have a reason to live. And what happens is we don't see each other, and... Uh, I call her up, and what she says is, Evie, New York happened a long time ago. And I'm like, yeah, I know, I know, but you know, tell me the secret. I know the secret. I've guessed the secret. Tell me. And she says, there was no secret. I was in a blackout when I said that. And now, I had gone away to college to be somebody and to show them. And I swore off alcohol. And now, there was just no reason why not drink. I just had no reason to live, and I just 
You know, uh, now I am my brother. I am in my mind that just absolute crazy. The voices are screaming in my head. And uh, the bottom line is, is that I, I just, I want to die. And there was a suicide on campus. This guy jumped from the bridge, and I went to the funeral. And I'm crying, not because he died, not because I missed him, not because I knew him, but because he had what I wanted for one hour. He had a whole room full of people crying for him. And I got real drunk and real stoned, and I was going to do it, and I was going to do it. And I don't know how much time passed, and I don't know how long I was in this, like, total drunken stupor. But at some point, I imagined that I had jumped, and I was at my own funeral, and nobody came because nobody cared. And I thought, you know, I'm 23 years old, and I just thought, you know, I don't want to die like that. I mean, thank God for alcoholic self-obsession, because if it weren't for that, I might have just done it. But God forbid <laughs> nobody come, you know? And what happened was there was a, I got a phone call and, and someone said, you know, there's still room in the car if you want to come to California. It was spring break, it was 1984, and I came to California. And uh, I went to my very first meeting in, in Hollywood. Um, I had already gone to some meetings in Tacoma, you know, I'm still thinking that Andrew might change her mind and so now I'll have a reason to live. I did not have a reason to live because I didn't matter to me. I just had so much self-hatred. But I started going to meetings in Hollywood and, uh, one of these meetings, I, the people were very, very kind to me, you know, and at one of these meetings, I met a gal named Darren. Darren was 14 years old. Darren had 90 days or 30 days. She was like a punk rocker. She had like spider webs painted on her eyes and a rat on her shoulder. And she was the one who told me, you know, when you want to drink, read the big book, go to meetings and pray. You know, at the end of that spring break, I moved back to Tacoma to finish up the semester. And I, I stay sober for, I don't remember, like 37 days. And then I'm, I'm drinking again. And for the next four and a half months, that was all that I was doing. It was just a matter of time before I moved back here. You know, in Bill's story, he talks about being so drunk that he, he took a final exam drunk. You know, one of my last final exams was a chemistry exam. And I, I literally, the voices were so real, I asked the chemistry professor if he heard voices. I mean, they were that loud. I assumed everyone else heard them. You know, um, I moved to L.A. in, in May of 84. And... Uh, Again, I didn't get sober right away. Um, I I had my last drink on October 13, 1984. Um, my first sponsor helped really build a foundation of brick. You know, I was I how I met her. Someone said you're going to meet someone at this meeting named Rosie. You tell Rosie Ann Wallace wants her to take care of you tonight. And so I go up to there's like this one woman in the room and she's scary. You know, I mean she's just scary. And I said excuse me, is your name Rosie? And she's like, yeah. I was like, uh, Ann Wallace wants you to take care of me tonight. And, and and Rosie became my sponsor. And she told me to go to a meeting a day. Now, I had college. So I thought I could get well or quicker. So I went to three meetings a day. Now, in 30 days or in 90 meetings, you get a 30-day chip, you know. But what it did for me was, and what Rosie also said, is if I have... Ten days of sobriety, and you have two. I have eight more days of experience, strength, and hope. And for someone who was absolutely reeking of self-hatred, that mattered. And she told me to get two phone numbers at every meeting. So I would go to the meeting. And I don't know how to talk to people, so I'm just going up to two of you. Excuse me, my sponsor told me I have to get two phone numbers. Can I get your numbers? <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I got commitments, you know, I, I, like I, I did the cookies perfectly aligned until you ate the cookies, you know. She told me to get those two phone numbers, and what I did was for anyone who raised their hand, your phone number went in my B list for brand spanking new, and I knew that you had less than 30 days. You know, I remember one day I called Rosie up and I was suicidal. I, I've always been suicidal. You know, it was just, it was that fleeting thought, you know, like should I, do my laundry, should I go grocery shopping, should I kill myself? You know, it's kind of, you know, I mean, it's sometimes still there, you know? I just, it's it's just still there, you know? But um, I remember I called her up one day, and um, and, and I, 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 I was crying. And she's like, well, why are you crying? I'm like, well, I didn't know why I was crying. I was just crying. And she's like, well, are you sober? I'm like, well, yeah. She's like, well, did anybody die? I'm like, well, no. She said, then find a newcomer and tell him I stayed sober. Boom. 
I'm just like hung up the phone. And I'm thinking, holy smokes. I mean, this is how you treat someone who's suicidal? But that was how I learned to work with others. You know, um, <laughs> when I, uh, you know, my first job out of high school was at Jack in the Box. Now, when I got sober, you know, I'm bloated. You know, I weigh 160 pounds. I, I wear like these blue, these navy blue fleece, like athletic pants. And that's all I had. And then like this black leotard. And so, you know, when that's all you have, the, the inner thighs, especially if your thighs rub together, then it gets really thin. And then it gets holes. You know, I mean, I had people that gave me clothes. You know, and um, I love our, you know, tenth tradition about having no opinion on outside issues. I mean, I had a clothes sponsor because I did not know how to dress. You know, and I have a, I have a finance sponsor because I didn't, I didn't know how to, you know, do money and such. You know, I, um, I was going to share this. It might sound so s silly to some of you. But, you know, I drove here in my first brand new car. And I say that because when I was nine months sober, I bought my first car from my sponsor. It was a 1969 VW Bug. You taught me how to take care of things in my life. You didn't say take care of it and then get rid of it. So I had that car for 26 years. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, I had to let that car go. Actually, she's, she has a new home. She's with a high school student, you know, whose dad fixed her up. But um, anyway, um, so my, when I got sober, Rosie said I needed to get a job. And so I got a job at Jack in the Box because they gave me a pair of pants to wear, you know. And I, I, I you know, and my, and then I got a different sponsor. My sponsor would come through the drive-through, and she said, "You know, your job today, you don't know why these people are coming in. It might be the absolute worst day of their life. Your job is to give them the best meal of the day." And I just took that in pride, and it's like, okay, you know. And I was a great Jack in the Box employee. You know, you taught me that I could do anything I wanted to do in sobriety as long as I'm willing to pay the price. You know, it started off at massage school, and then when I was two and a half years sober, I went to chiropractic college, and then I, I became a chiropractic radiologist. Um, actually, what happened was I, I, I did my first residency. I took the boards. I didn't pass it. I, uh, and I hit a sober bottom. I was, I was, um, 16 years sober. I, I didn't pass my chiropractic radiology boards to become a chiropractic radiologist. Um, the person that I'd been dating left me for someone who owned a successful clinic. So in my mind, I make a decision. I'm going to buy a successful clinic so I can win her back. Now, sadly, and this is where my sponsor I now understand is helping me see the humor in it. She left me for a guy, or she left a guy for me, and then she left me for a guy. So... You know, maybe it wasn't the successful clinic that he had that she wanted. You know? But I bought a clinic. You know? I, I bought a clinic, and it, I bought a clinic to win someone back. You know, that's not a motive. That's just not a motive, you know? And, uh, I, you know, but, but I, I, I didn't want the clinic. I, I just didn't want the clinic. I let it go under. And, uh, and I made a lot of bad decisions like you now know. And uh, I hit a sober bottom when I was one month shy of my 17th year of sobriety. And um, I was introduced to a man named John. And uh, John was a judge, and he had a gun in his mouth when he was 17 years sober. And John became my sponsor. And, and two of the most important prayers that John taught me was first the set-aside prayer. I'm living in Oregon when this is all happening. And, he, and the prayer is, dear God, set aside everything. I think I know about you, about me, about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and these steps. Grant me an open mind and a new experience about you, about me, about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and these steps. And the other thing is this. I put everything above Alcoholics Anonymous and sobriety. The clinic, the relationship, my sobriety. I put it all in front of sobriety itself. And whenever I put anything above or before sobriety and God, they're going to go. And so the second prayer that he taught me was this. If, if this microphone is God, 
The prayer is, dear God, and he calls it the pre-third step prayer. You know, I used to think the bondage of self, you know, dear God, relieve me of the bondage of self. I used to think that was self-obsession. He, his experience was that the bondage of self are all those things. And so the prayer is, dear God, take me to a place where clinic, relationship, whatever, is infinitely less important than an awesome relationship with you. Because then when I do that, with all those things, God is everything. You know that line in the book, God is either everything or he is nothing. I never got that until I got that. Um, September 11th happened, and uh, basically what September 11th did was it, it, it just made me want to finish what I started. You taught me to finish what I started. And so I did the footwork to retake the chiropractic radiology board exam. And uh, most people become a chiropractic radiologist in three years. You know, for me, it was two three-year residencies, a one-year fellowship, a two-year hospital-based radiography program. And in 2011, I finished it. I finished it. Um, I moved back to L.A. in October of 2011. And uh, I started dating someone who had a very charismatic program and was 11 years sober when I met her and then was 12 years sober. And... Uh, Fifteen months into that relationship, um, I went over to her apartment and there was a beer carton in the kitchen. I thought, well, that's odd. Maybe she was just, you know, entertaining neighbors or whatever. And uh, so after a while, I asked her about that. And I said, you know, no judgment, just a question. Is it yours? And she said, yeah. I said, okay. How long have you been drinking? And she said, um, 18 months. So the whole time that we were dating, she was not sober. And uh, I bring this up because what that did for me was this. When I hit that sober bottom, I had been taking medication. You can't cry. Or you can't tell my sponsor. <laughs> and uh, how my alcoholism manifests, and I know that today, is this, what my alcoholism said is with everything going on, if you were seeing a therapist, she would tell you to double the dose. So I did what the imaginary therapist did when I hit that sober bottom, and, and a couple times I took a double dose of medication. Now when I hit that sober bottom, my sponsor and everyone who I've since talked to said, this is Alcoholics Anonymous and you didn't drink. So I didn't change my date. But when that person that I was dating shared with me that she had not been sober, what it did for me, see, I always felt like there was an asterisk on my sobriety date. From the time I took that double dose, there was always this, this guilt. One pill, two pills, but there was this guilt. So for me, bottom line was about 15 months ago, I talked with my, my sponsor at the time. I talked to my grand sponsor. The bottom line is, is that what my friend did became the catalyst for me to just want to be clean. And so, uh, so I changed my date. I changed my date to when I just stopped taking medication altogether. Because I mucked up on medication. This has nothing to do with medication. It's just my experience. I mucked up on medication. I felt bad. It didn't sit right with me for a long time. But when someone else revealed that she had not been sober, I just decided, you know what? I'm not worried about the last 31 years. I'm worried about the next 31 years. So my sobriety date is July 4th of 2011. And I st it's... You know, today I'm grateful because for a long time in sobriety, there was still a lot of self-hatred because I got sober at 23 and I moved to L.A. when I was 23. So Hollywood stars and old-timers were in the same league of like, wow. And so that was all I wanted to be was this old-timer. That was, you know, I got, today in hindsight, I can look back on my sobriety more objectively and realize that I got really caught up in 
you know, I'm somebody because I'm sober X amount of time, and, and now you should be my friend because I'm sober X amount of time, and I just, somewhere my ego just took over, you know, and so I didn't share my date right up front because I, I was afraid he'd be like me and judge me, like, you know, oh my God, they're only that much sober and they're here, oh, you know, so I didn't share my date right up front, um, I'm already out of time, but, um, you know, for me, I'm really grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous because I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't have had the borrowed time that I've had. You know, I probably will never take a 30-year cake. But that's okay today because I, I'm i really getting it that it's not about... I've had to let go of my old ideas, you know. So to just close, I just want to welcome you if you're new but especially, and maybe now you understand, if you've got double-digit sobriety and you've hit a sober bottom and you're dying of alcoholism in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous or you've just had a secret like I did or whatever, and you just, there's that, I felt that pressure. Like, oh my God, I can't tell them. What will they think? I get that. I really get that. You know, and I just, I didn't cry. Right? I didn't cry. I just, I really, most of all, I'm sorry, I'm out of time. I just want to thank you. you. Again, I was not the life of the party. I'm I'm learning how to be a little bit at a time. You know, I'm not like so deathly serious. Sometimes I am. I still ask, you know, what's the meaning of life? But we get to do that. That's what the steps are about. You know, I'm in the middle of a four step. My sponsor's name was Hilda. Oh, my home group is a Pacific group. I hope you'll all come. And And most of all, one more time, just Thank you for welcoming me very much. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.